You can you hear me? Yes. Great. So, I, you know, I think many of you already know VJ, um, but for those of you that don't, we buckle up. So I remember many years ago when the hurricane team up at GFDL would mention some dude named VJ, and they would mention him rather frequently. Um, I didn't know him at the time, but the interaction between VJ and the hurricane team up there seemed generally positive. So my impression was that VJ was more or less useful to the effort. Well, a couple of years ago, I, I got to actually meet and work with VJ, and it was then that I began to understand the enormity of his impact in many, many areas of numerical weather prediction. And it's not surprising given his background. Uh, so he received his PhD jointly from Andhra University in India and Florida State University under Krish. And he stuck around Florida State University um, on the faculty and as a research associate. And then he came up to uh, EMC about 15 years ago or so and took charge of some of the hurricane efforts there. And a few years later, in 2015, uh, he became chief of the Global Climate and Weather Prediction Branch at the Environmental Modeling Center. And after EMC's reorganization, he became chief of the Modeling and Data Assimilation Branch, which is the position he currently holds at EMC. And there he oversees three research and development groups in data assimilation, uh, coupled modeling and dynamics and physics. So VJ's latest leadership challenge is his planning that's going to move us from the current NSEP production suite into a series of fewer but more complex applications that are based on a unified forecast system. And one of the concepts in the UFS is that each application, uh, including global prediction systems that address the medium range to sub-seasonal to seasonal, that each of these systems adopts an ensemble approach. And it is my pleasure to introduce uh, VJ today to tell us more about this. Thank you, Brian. VJ, I've unmuted you and I'm going to make you the presenter now. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Did we just lose the guy? I don't see him in the attendee. Can you all hear the guy? Yeah, I'm here. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen and we can hear you. Okay, thank you. So uh, again, thanks for the nice introduction, Brian, and I'm glad uh, I had this opportunity to uh, to present at the UFS webinar series. Uh, we had an excellent presentation uh, last time from Jeff Pitaker, so the standards were set high. I hope I can meet the expectations here. Uh, I have uh, a lot of good news to share here today, uh, especially the implementation of the Global Ensemble Forecast System. This is the first UFS medium range and sub-seasonal weather application. Uh, the extension of medium range to sub-seasonal is happening with this uh, implementation, which is scheduled for September uh, later this year. And uh, uh, since this is an ensemble system, the focus is not just the deterministic part of it, but also on the probabilistic guidance. Uh, and uh, in addition to ensemble upgrade, we are also making a big step towards unifying the NSEP production suite. Uh, there are several global model applications that are going to be combined uh, with this implementation. So this is, in in a sense, uh, a coupled model uh, that's going to be implemented uh, uh, that will combine the aerosol component as well as the wave ensembles uh, that are currently providing uh, operational products. So there are three uh, major applications combined into one. So this is by far the biggest implementation project uh, EMC has ever handled. And uh, I will try to describe what we have done so far. But before that, I would like to acknowledge the community effort here that, that led to uh, where we stand today. And uh, there are several uh, individual groups 
that have uh, participated in this development and transition to operations activities. Uh, there are four uh, big teams within EMC, the Ensemble project team, the WAVE project team, the Aerosol, and the GFS project team, the deterministic model. Those have contributed uh, mightily to the science of it. Uh, this project also comes with uh, a reanalysis and reforecast of the 21st century. And this is a joint effort led by PSL and EMC. Uh, Tom Hamill uh, is the main uh, person leading that uh, from um so uh i heard from ivanka we are only seeing uh can you see the entire screen or we are only seeing your desktop yeah that, now we can see your screen okay all right so i'm trying to uh have two screens and i'm trying to make it uh, shown on one side Give me a second. All right, I'll try to keep it as maximum as possible here. So uh, continuing on the acknowledgements, we have uh, the wave, WAVE team uh, coming up with a uh, unification aspect as well as the WAVE development. And the aerosol project team in collaboration with the GSL have uh, developed this chemistry component that combined the atmosphere with the chemistry. And we have uh, several people who helped with the uh, evaluation of GEPS V12 and our verification, post-processing and product generation branch uh, have the model evaluation group, which led the independent evaluation of the ensemble performance, uh, the coordination with the field led by Jeff Manikin, uh, the engineering branch supported the workflow, the compliance with the standards, and optimization of the resources. Uh, we have NCO team uh, to pick up the codes and do the final transition to operations. The staff uh, from STI have helped a lot in supporting the technical coordination. Uh, CPC has done an excellent job evaluating the performance for week two, weeks three and four uh, into the sub-seasonal aspects. Water Center is our main collaborator or customer to uh, validate the reanalysis and reforecast products along with CPC. And this will lead into the development of the hydrological ensemble forecast system based on the GAPS V12. All the NSEP centers and the NWS regions have participated in this uh, performance evaluation for GAPS V12. And uh, so that I will describe in my, uh, my talk today. So the topics that I'm going to cover include the review of the science changes, the statistical evaluation uh, of the GAPS V12, and then the stakeholder evaluation, some benefits and concerns uh, identified by these uh, evaluation aspects, and uh, the timeline for implementation uh, as the as the culmination of this project. So for those uh, who know uh, the global ensemble forecast system, uh, which is currently operational at NSEP, uh, has started in 1992 with a with a three member ensembles, uh, and uh, it has evolved uh, over time in the last couple of decades, or uh, three decades, and now uh, as of uh, today, the current operational uh, system is uh, a 21 member ensemble running at different resolutions the initial uh, eight day first eight days are run at 33 kilometers and the 8 to 16 day is run at 50 kilometer resolution it runs four times a day and uh, uses uh, various different techniques for uh, perturbing both the initial conditions and and the model states the v12 uh, which is uh, planned for implementation later this year is the first unified forecast system based uh, ensemble uh, that will use more modern stochastic physics methods and initial uncertainties. And it increases the forecast length to 35 days at every uh, every day at 0z and have uh, 31 members for the global atmosphere and wave ensembles and one member for global aerosols. The history of the GEFS performance uh, uh, as measured by the CRPS score, uh, which is kind of a metric of useful forecasts, uh, in, in terms of uh, ranked probabilistic skill is, is a tool that, that we use to measure the en ensemble performance. And uh, back in 2000s, the useful skill is about six days. 
and recently it has exceeded nine days. And there are a couple of instances where the skill is much higher than the normal years. They are uh, associated with the ENSO periods. And uh, so there is a steady growth of uh, the CRPS score uh, over the period of uh, last 30 years. And uh, CRPS 0.25 is uh, similar to 0.6 anomaly correlation score uh, from the deterministic model. So it is kind of a one day per decade improvement uh, of forecast scale in the last uh, in the last 30 years. So the proposed uh, V12 configuration in comparison to the V11, uh, the GFS model that provides the basic dynamics and physics uh, framework, we have now switched to FE3, uh, the finite volume cube sphere dynamic core, very similar to what we have currently in operational GFS. The physics also aligned very well with the current operational GFS physics, where we replace the GFS microphysics with the GFDL microphysics. The initial perturbations come from ensemble forecasts from the GDAS. The six hour forecasts of 80 member ensembles provide initial perturbations. The model uncertainty comes from, uh, instead of the stochastic uh, total tendency perturbations, we will have stochastic physical perturbation tendencies and the stochastic kinetic energy backscatter. These are uh, well um, documented uh, stochastic methods that are widely used, especially at European Center and uh, other operational centers. The boundary forcing, uh, especially for the ocean, comes both from NSST, the near surface sea temperature, and also the two tiered SSTs for the extended range, where we take uh, the calibrated CFS forecasted SST and apply it to the GFS ensembles. The tropical storms, we were using relocation uh, in, the, in the current operational system. We will not be doing that very similar to what we have done for the GFS V15. The horizontal resolution will be increased and make uniform across the scales. Uh, all 16 days and 35 day forecasts will be made at a quarter degree resolution instead of switching to uh, 55 kilometers or, or changing midway. The vertical resolution will be consistent with the current GFS. We will have four cycles per day. Every day at zero Z, uh, we provide 35 day forecasts. The control with the 30 perturbed members and one aerosol members are uh, providing the uncertainty information in terms of ensembles. The output resolution will also be increased to quarter degree along with half a degree products. The frequency of output will be three hourly for, first, first day, for, for the first 10 days and the six hourly for the rest of it. The reforecasts uh, are done for 31 years. Uh, we added one more year after uh, completing the 2018, and it is planned for implementation in 2020, September. Uh, to refresh uh, people on, on the dynamic core, uh, this is the UFS uh, dynamic core. Uh, NGGPS has chosen this, the finite volume cube sphere developed at GFDL. And there are small changes between how the GFS operational model is run and how the ensemble system is run, especially with the time step. Uh, with the 450 seconds uh, and uh, some other small changes to accommodate the, the changes required for ensemble configuration. And as I mentioned, we replaced uh, the GFDL microphysics uh, is now providing the, uh, the hydrometeor information instead of the old uh, Jaukar microphysics. This is a six class uh, uh, five prognostic cloud species and uh, has shown that it has uh, better performance in terms of precipitation forecasts. In terms of model and uncertainty, the GDAS 80 member ensembles will provide uh, the perturbations. Uh, we stagger those ensemble members in such a way that at each cycle, we take different ensemble members to increase the variability. And uh, that continues uh, for all four cycles. There is no tropical cyclone relocation uh, as, uh, as it was not necessary anymore because of the higher resolution models that we are using. And the model uncertainty is represented through the stochastic kinetic energy backscatter and uh, SPPT. We also considered the specific humidity perturbations, but that was uh, not helping with increase in the, in the, in the spread, uh, so we had to drop that. Uh, we also don't uh, perturb the radiation for clear sky, and also the divided streamlines uh, are excluded from these perturbations. One of the reasons why we are using the six hour forecast is because the analysis uh, uh, is uh, done a little later than when the GFS need to start its integration. So we had to switch to the previous cycle six hour forecast as the guidance for 
initial condition perturbations. And in general, the perturbation quality from the ensembles of GDAS are not different from the analysis versus the six hour forecast in all uh, uh, geographical regions that, that we were able to uh, demonstrate here. And in terms of how the new SCAB and SPPT uh, have helped the old STTP, the stochastic tendency of total perturbations, has a, a different uh, spread error ratio that was not uh, conducive for providing meaningful spread. With the new schemes, uh, the spread is evenly distributed, and uh, the under dispersiveness of the current operational system is mainly uh, uh, alleviated with this uh, new stochastic method. The ocean forcing, the current system uses the persistence and relaxation uh, for SSTs, whereas the new system will be using NSST, the near surface sea temperature, and also bias corrected CFS V2 forecasts. This is uh, uh, to provide uh, the, the extended range uh, uh, boundary conditions for, for the model forecasts. And it also showed that the NSST with the two tiered SST uh, has improved the tropical forecasts. Uh, significantly compared to the persistence methods. This project also, uh, as I mentioned, came with a, a, a big reanalysis and reforecast project that started uh, almost three years ago. And uh, we successfully completed a 20 year reanalysis uh, project that was led by the PSD and the 31 year reforecast led by EMC. It used the same model as uh, the GEPS V12 and uh, for the first 11 years where there was no reanalysis available, we used the CFS analysis. And for the rest of the 20 years, uh, G uh, PSL has developed this new ENKF incremental analysis update that, uh, that's also going into the GFS V16. So that uh, advanced data simulation was used uh, to reprocess the data for the last 20 years and generate uh, the reanalysis. It has a different uh, cadence uh, in terms of frequency and ensemble size. Uh, like I was showing here, each uh, each day, uh, each week, uh, uh, we have 35 day forecast with 11 members, uh, and every day we have 16 days for five members, and this is to cater to various needs of our customers and stakeholders. The output uh, is stored at quarter degree resolution for the first 10 days, every three hours, and then half a degree uh, beyond six days. And uh, uh, the 77 variables are selected uh, uh, to keep on the desk for use by CPC, MDL, and the water center. And PSL is converting this grip data into a usable NextCDF format, and the data will be made publicly available through our uh, FTP servers. And also the Amazon Cloud is going to host all this data for uh, research and applications. The wave component, this is the first time we are introducing the waves into the atmospheric model. Uh, the atmospheric model is now coupled to the wave model. Uh, it's only a one-way coupling right now. Uh, there is no feedback from the waves to the atmosphere yet. Uh, the ENSOP wave ensembles uh, has started its initial products in 2004 with a version one, uh, and now with a version four integrated into GEFS V12. We are increasing the resolution to quarter degree, and extending the forecast length to 16 days. And the forcing uh, from the atmosphere is done every hour instead of every six hours, uh, as in the current operational wave ensembles. There are uh, several firsts uh, with this wave ensemble. This is the first global scale UFS coupled system. Integration of wave model uh, is done in the global workflow. The source terms have been improved, and the optimization is done with the hourly surface wind forcing. We also added a swell partition in the gridded outputs. The membership uh, will be increased from 21 to 31, consistent with the atmospheric model. The spherical grid resolution increased to quarter degree globally. And uh, the results uh, I will share later show a very uh, significant improvements. The other uh, integration uh, or unification is the aerosol member. Uh, one additional member of the GAPS V12 uh, will run with the aerosol component. This is to replace the current operational global aerosol component, NGAC V2. Uh, it uses the same GFS meteorology, uh, except at quarter degree resolution, and it runs four times a day. And the inline aerosol representation is based on the GSD chemistry uh, uh, using the go-kart. The sulfates, organic carbon, black carbon, 
dust and sea salt all are included in the in the uh, AOD. The emissions uh, will use the common emissions data, database as well as the GBB, EPX, biomass burning, Feng Sha dust, and uh, the satellite product GS5, sea salt, and the marine DMS data sets. Uh, NESDIS and ARL have provided uh, a significant support in providing these data sets. The initial conditions are cycled for results, but they use uh, the V15 analysis for meteorology. The smoke plume, smoke plume rise is a wind shear dependent 1D cloud model that is integrated into our convection scheme. The Arkawa uh, Schubert scheme has, uh, has been changed to include the tracer transport and wet scavenging, and the fluxes are calculated positive, definitive, uh, and uh, a scavenging coefficient of 0.2 is used for all aerosol species. So I'll switch to the evaluation of uh, the atmospheric component of the GEFS B12, uh, initially focusing on the medium range weather. These are uh, based on two and a half year retrospective forecasts uh, run from June 2017 through November 2019 with all 31 members. And uh, the results are based on uh, these extensive uh, retrospective period. The CRPS scale for 500 millibar anomaly correlations uh, the, for the geopotential height uh, is, uh, is now showing uh, about half a day increase in our useful scale. Uh, this is for the northern hemisphere and this is for the southern hemisphere on the right. In both uh, hemispheres, the GAPS V12 increases the useful, useful skill by about 12 hours. In terms of uh, uh, the time series for all seasons, uh, we can see a steady increase uh, uniformly across all periods, uh, starting from summer 2017 all the way to fall 2019, uh, both for northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere. And one of the ENSO periods is captured here, actually uh, the ENSO winter in 2017-18, where the scale is uh, substantially higher. And the southern hemisphere uh, also showed similar uh, significant improvements across all seasons. The scale for the winds, both at the 850 hectopascal and 250 hectopascal, uh, also showed the, the useful forecast increased by about 0.5 days in the northern hemisphere uh, at the 850 level and uh, by about 0.6 days at the upper levels for the general winds. Uh, the biggest improvement comes with the precipitation forecast. This is the PQPF, the probabilistic quantitative precipitation forecast for the corners. And these are different thresholds, the one millimeter threshold, five millimeter per day, and the 20 millimeter per day. In all uh, these categories, uh, in all thresholds, the scale is extended by more than a day uh, for, uh, for all uh, uh, thresholds that we have examined here compared to the current operational system. And the reliability curve uh, shown here in this box actually shows how uh, the, the red curve from the GEFS V12 is more closely aligned with the diagonal uh, compared to the current operational system, which is uh, less reliable, especially for higher uh, uh, thresholds of the forecast probability. And uh, in general, the gaps which will forecasts are found to be more reliable, both from subjective as well as objective evaluation. Uh, in terms of time series, uh, there is a seasonal variation in terms of the QPF uh, scale. And uh, in general, the scale has increased uh, over all uh, time periods of this evaluation, both for uh, the lower end of the threshold, one millimeter per day, and also the 20 millimeter per day. And, and especially for 20 millimeter per day, summertime, the scale is still uh, much lower for the current operational system. Uh, for the first time, we are into the positive range and the scale improvements are rather significant uh, for, for the medium range predictions here. One of the examples here in terms of improved reliability and the Briar score, uh, the example that we are showing here in the GAPS V11, this is uh, uh, the probabilistic QPF, and the V11 is uh, showing a pretty overconfident uh, rainfall event uh, of a greater than quarter inch in 24 hours for a five day forecast. The GAPS V12 rightfully uh, has uh, reduced that over prediction and is more aligned with uh, the observations compared to the GAPS V11. The difference field can clearly illustrate how GAPS V11 is uh, over predicting the precipitation for this particular event. Uh, in terms of hurricane track forecasts and errors, this is another major improvement. 
the current operational system is uh, uh, well known for its under dispersiveness and uh, uh, we increased uh, the spread substantially with the gaps v12 the dashed line is the spread and the solid line is the error and in all three seasons that we looked at this is all basins north and pacific eastern pacific and atlantic the, the dispersion or the spread increased significantly compared to the V11, and the errors also have decreased reasonably compared to the gaps V11. In terms of the track verification, these are for three different basins now, Atlantic Basin for all three years, 2017 through 19, there is a significant improvement in the track forecast errors, uh, much reduced uh, compared to the V11 in production. Uh, Eastern Pacific, the skill is almost same as the current operational system until uh, about 96 hours. There is a slight degradation beyond 96 hours, although it is not statistically significant. The West Pacific also has seen improvement beyond day five, uh, similar to the Atlantic Basin. In terms of TC intensity, this is where I think uh, the biggest bang for the buck, uh, the increased uh, resolution and the FE3 dynamic core and increased membership, they're all playing a factor here. The reduction in intensity errors is uh, quite outstanding in all basins, the Atlantic, Eastern Pacific, and West Pacific, the tropical storm uh, errors for the intensity forecast are much reduced uh, and, and the structure forecasts also have uh, significantly improved uh, with the gaps B12. There is a lot more evaluation uh, for those who care for. There is a big list of uh, uh, presentation that that, that have been made since uh, early February. Uh, this is the collection of uh, presentations from the model evaluation group, uh, starting with FE3 dynamic core information all the way to CPC's uh, three and four week, three, four evaluation. Uh, all these uh, presentations are available on this link here, uh, the FE3 GEFSV12 uh, evaluation page. And they also include Verification of 45 specific case studies uh, selected by the model evaluation group in collaboration with the field. Uh, so please uh, uh, go through these uh, to your convenience. Uh, I'm going to take a few highlights from each of them uh, to demonstrate here. And then I'm continuing with that statistical evaluation of the atmospheric component of the GAPS B12. Now to uh, include the extended range and the subseasonal weather forecast that, that means the weeks two weeks three and four uh, these are both based on the two and a half year retrospectives that are used for the first 10 days and also the 31 year reforecast uh, from 1989 to 2019 and most of this work is done by cpc colleagues and uh, matt rosenkrantz has done a great job describing all the efforts from cpc uh, with this evaluation and i'm going to take some highlights from uh, his presentation these are uh, aggregate scores for the 500 millibar anomaly correlation for the Northern Hemisphere, the week two uh, the anomaly correlation and the weeks three and four combined. And the summary here in this table has both the CFS V2, which is uh, uh, currently the standard for week two uh, predictions uh, from CPC. And we also have an experimental subseasonal prediction from the current GAPS V11. Uh, it's not operational, it is a research product that we share with CPC, and uh, that's a combination of many centers who are providing ensembles uh, from various groups. Uh, so it is kind of a multi-model ensemble uh, that CPC uses for the subseasonal forecast, and the GAPS uh, is one of those members. And compared to those two models, the GAPS V12 has increased the anomaly correlation quite significantly, about 0.03, uh, which is uh, rather significant. And also uh, for weeks three and four, uh, compared to the CFS, uh, definitely uh, a huge uh, improvement uh, in the anomaly correlation for the 500 millibar geopotential heights. In terms of the die off curves, uh, again, the days with uh, anomaly correlation about 0. 0.5 is uh, shown here. The GAPS V12 has uh, during the winter time 12 days, uh, the March, April, May, it's 10 days, June, July, August, nine days. 10 days for the September, October, November, both for the Northern Hemisphere and the Pacific North American region. And compared to the CFS V2 and the SUBAX, uh, the GAPS V12 uh, significantly improved the, the skill of uh, uh, the anomaly correlations for 500 millibar. 
in terms of the reforecasts that were used uh, to evaluate the polar jet at uh, 10 hectopascal. This is kind of a stratospheric evaluation. Uh, this is done for both 16-day forecasts and also 35-day forecasts here compared with analysis. And uh, most of the time, the GAPS V12 did pretty good compared to the analysis. Uh, there are still uh, some issues that, that were noted here, especially during the winter time. Uh, the maximum winds are under forecasted. The sudden warmings, uh, like the wind uh, reversal happens uh, occasionally. Those are either under forecasted or not forecasted. Those are uh, really the future challenges that need to be addressed. In terms of the QBO, the quasi biennial oscillation, the journal winds at 50 hectopascal. The QBO from GAPS V12 uh, is well preserved out to 35 days. You can see here in the bottom panel, the analysis and the 35 day forecasts are pretty well matched in terms of both the phase as well as the amplitude. And uh, uh, however, there are westerlies that are becoming more under forecast. Uh, uh, with time, which uh, did not happen at the 10 millibar, but uh, at the 50 millibar, this is happening. Easterlies are also uh, kind of under forecast with time, but the phase and amplitude are reasonably captured by the gaps V12. Uh, the biggest improvement came from uh, the analysis of uh, the temperature forecasts. This is a uh, northern hemispheric uh, high latitude, 60 to 90 north. Uh, the lines here represent different forecast hours, 96 through 384, compared with the analysis in black. The left side, what you're seeing is the 10 hectopascal and 50 hectopascal temperatures from the GAPS V11. Uh, there are significant problems with uh, uh, prediction of temperature by uh, the GAPS V11, but if you look at the GAPS V12, uh, they are pretty much aligned with the analysis, less day-to-day -day variability, and much better accuracy. This is for a period of October 1st through November, 9th, November 30th, uh, 2019. Uh, if you look at the vertical, uh, uh, the, the journal distribution of the temperature uh, forecasts, again, the 30-day errors uh, ending November 30th, GAPS V11 compared to the GAPS V12, a significant reduction of these biases uh, compared to the GAPS V11, almost no bias near the equatorial tropics. Uh, there are still, uh, there is a reversal of uh, the biases, uh, especially at the higher latitudes uh, and the polar regions. But in general, most of the tropical region, the analysis errors, uh, the temp temperature errors are substantially reduced. The journal wind forecast also, you can see a substantial reduction in the northern hemisphere, uh, reduction in the equatorial region, and also in the southern hemisphere. Uh, the week two temperature, this is the average high key skill score, uh, which is a representation of uh, how the temperature uh, is, uh, is, is measured in terms of the skill. And the GAPS V12 uh, showed a uh, higher high key skill score in about eight out of 12 months, especially during the summertime where the skill is uh, pretty high, uh, May, June, and July. Overall, uh, V12 is uh, uh, much higher in skill with a 95% significance test passing uh, compared to the GAPS V10. Precipitation skill scores, this is the hardest part. The V2 precipitation has literally no skill. However, compared to the V10, the GAPS V12 has uh, uh, about eight out of 12 months higher skill, uh, but it's only passing the significance test at 87% level. Uh, moving on to weeks three and four, this is even harder uh, to capture the skill. Uh, but for the temperature, we have increased this substantially, the skill compared to the CFS uh, from 9.15, uh, the skill has increased to about 14.31, uh, passing a t-test at 95% significance level. This is the weeks three and four combined. Uh, precipitation, there is a increase in the uh, high key skill score from 4.5 to five, but this is not statistically significant However, some of these uh, results are still useful for uh, increased uh, skill for precipitation outlooks for weeks three and four. The tropical cyclone count and tracks, the anomaly correlations uh, are used to compute uh, uh, the skill of the tropical cyclone genesis as well as intensity. And the gaps uh, is now compared against multiple models here, the CFS, the Canadian model, the ECMWF model, and the gaps V12 in black. And in the week one, GFS V12 actually exceeds the skill of both CFS and the European Center. 
even the week two and week three and week four, uh, the performance of GAPS B12 is uh, significantly higher uh, compared to the other models. There are some good years like 2004, uh, 2005. However, 2006, uh, there is a skill that, that's not as good. The MJO is another measure for the subseasonal forecast skill. Uh, this is uh, Madden Julian oscillation. The RMM skill scores are used here to measure the usefulness of the forecasts. The MJO prediction now extends uh, from about 18 days to close to 21 days with the GAPS B12 compared to the GAPS B uh, compared to the CFS. This is the first phase of our reforecasts. Uh, so it's about uh, two days uh, increase in the skill. And for the next 20 years, compared to the sub -X, the skill has increased again from about 21 days to uh, 23 days. Uh, this is, uh, again, substantial improvement uh, compared to any other operational models as well. Uh, the skill uh, is now exceeding 23 days. Uh, just for records, European Central skill is about 25 days. So we're still uh, two days short of what uh, other major centers are doing. The other quality of uh, the MJO is the propagation. The, the northward propagation and eastward propagation are the two uh, specific aspects of MJO that are pretty hard for capturing in our uh, seasonal or climate models, uh, especially in the central Indian Ocean. These are associated with intra-seasonal oscillations and the monsoon circulation. Uh, the propagation of MJO, MJO in the east-west direction is uh, well captured here. Uh, this is the analysis from the OLR, uh, and this is the gaps B12. Uh, and the, definitely there is a close match uh, between these two in terms of the eastward propagation. Uh, I'm not showing the northward propagation, but we don't have uh, much scale in terms of uh, the interseasonal or northward propagation of the MJO. So that's the conclusion of this weeks three and four. Now we will switch to statistical evaluation of the GAPS V12 aerosol component. Oh, sorry, this is the wave component. Uh, there's a typo here. Uh, Henrique and Diana Spindler uh, have done a lot of good work comparing the gaps with the global wave ensemble system that's currently in operations. And uh, the, the evaluation is done based on the significant wave height statistics compared against the altimeters, uh, both the RMS error, bias, and the CRPS, along with the 95th quantile. And uh, what you're seeing here is the RMSC error, uh, the RMS errors from the GAPS V12 waves is uh, substantially reduced compared to the current operational deterministic model, which is the multi one in green, and the current operational wave ensemble, which is the GUES in orange. Uh, compared to both of these configurations, the GAPS V12 reduced the RMS errors by more than half. Uh, similarly, the biases have reduced. It's very close to zero bias now. The CRPS uh, also has increased, and uh, uh, the 95th quantile also has uh, shown uh, substantial improvement uh, in the both short and long forecast ranges. Compared to the buoys, these are uh, independent observations. Uh, the same uh, statistics are compared. Now we also have the spread information put here. The current operational system in orange uh, has a lower spread compared to the GAPS B12 uh, waves, which has a, a significant increase in the spread. And also the errors were reduced. Uh, similarly, the bias has been reduced and the CRPS and 95th quantile also showed significant improvement compared to the buoy observations. Uh, the two other statistics that were looked at, this is the peak period of the wind seas. Uh, again, there is not much difference in terms of uh, Error reduction, but there is a significant improvement in the spread. Uh, um, and also the spread error relationship has improved, uh, both compared to the altimeters and buoys. And this is what we are showing here for buoys. Uh, the, the sh both at the long range and uh, the short range, the wind seas are now captured uh, in terms of peak period pretty nicely. Uh, compared to the swell peak period, again, similar results. The spread has increased. Not much improvement in the errors, but the error versus spread relationship has increased uh, a slight improvement uh, of the uncertainty, especially at the longer forecast time ranges. Switching on to uh, the GAPS aerosol evaluation, these are based on nine month retrospective forecasts from July 2019 through March 2020. This is a collaborative effort between EMC, GSL, CSL, 
uh, ARL, NESDIS, and also NASA. And uh, Jeff McQueen was the lead of this project with uh, Pada and Ivanka significantly contributing to this. Uh, the results shown here are from the operational NGAC, the NSEP Global Aerosol Component, against the GAPS Aerosol member for different months. This is the total AOD, the aerosol optical depth. Uh, the, the current operational system has uh, significant biases in different regions. That Those biases have significantly reduced. Uh, actually, some of the biases have reversed in sign, uh, particularly in, this, uh, in the African region. But overall, the, the biases have reduced uh, substantially over uh, uh, several periods, uh, uh, several regions, including the biomass burning regions, uh, Siberia and Amazon. There is uh, some overprediction in uh, Africa and also uh, to some extent in Australia. Uh, this is a uh, dust AOD. Uh, the, the first one is the total AOD. Now we are looking at the dust AOD. The overprediction in the Saharan region is almost eliminated. Uh, the aerosol still underpredict uh, some uh, uh, some dust in the Taklamakan desert. However, when compared to the European Center and the and the camps analysis, uh, we don't see much biases here. There is some uh, increased negative bias uh, in the in the winter time, especially uh, southern hemisphere summer time. Uh, especially near the African region. It's probably due to mix of uh, dust and smoke in the analysis. Uh, looking at the organic carbon, again, similar story. The biases were uh, significantly reduced. Uh, there is some overprediction of uh, organic carbon near the source regions, uh, like in the African region and the, and the Australia, especially in the, in the January timeframe. Uh, if you look at uh, the AOD forecast compared to Aeronet observations, these are again independent observations. The NGAC V2, these are the anomaly correlations uh, between uh, NGAC and Aeronet. The lower values in the blue colors are now uh, switched to oranges and greens. Uh, significant improvement in these correlations compared to the station observations uh, across various regions. Uh, that is also captured here. Uh, when you compare the AOD forecast to the MERA 2 reanalysis, uh, the North Africa, North Atlantic, South Africa, South Atlantic, South America, Europe, East Asia, uh, Eastern US, and Western US, in all regions, the, the GAPS aerosol member is uh, very closely matching the MERA analysis compared to uh, the NGAC. There are still some improvements that, that are desired, especially in the Europe and, uh, and in some parts of the Western US. But in, in, in general, there is a significant improvement over all major global regions. Uh, that's the statistical evaluation. And uh, in the next few minutes, I'll be focusing on how the field has engaged uh, in evaluating the GAPS V12. Uh, this is, again, a group effort uh, led by Jason Levitt of uh, VPPG uh, and Jeff Manikin of the MAG group in uh, support from the waves and aerosols and, and weeks three and four. Uh, from CPC. Uh, what the MAC did was to construct a formal evaluation plan, very similar to what we did with the GAPS GFS V15, but now expanded to include all other components. Seven webinars covered different uh, components of the V12 evaluation, and the comparison was done for 45 different cases, comparing V11 and V12 side by side, uh, and provided the graphics on a website. Uh, so. Uh, because we don't have real-time parallels uh, as part of this evaluation, the only way for the field is to look at the retrospectives and, and evaluate. Uh, the SU team uh, uh, did a great job coordinating these aspects as well. So the positive themes, higher anomaly correlations, increased ensemble spread, improved tracks, better handling of uh, extratropical cyclones, more reliable precip, improved representation near the topography, and uh, mitigation of the exaggerated offshore precip. Uh, this is supposed to be an animation. I'll skip that in the interest of time. Uh, the increased uh, and more useful spread is a common theme that came time and again uh, compared to the V11 and V12. Uh, V11 uh, sometimes was too aggressive in certain features. This is the Arctic outbreak. The GAPS V12 uh, certainly uh, did a great job uh, with more spread uh, along the tight baroclinic zone. So the quality of the spread uh, is uh, uh, is definitely appreciated by the field. 
Similarly, the, the forecast for uh, the, the plumes here, uh, this is another case in November, the GAPS B12 has a greater spread. Uh, the eventual solution was uh, to capture the mean within the envelope of the ensemble members. Sometimes the GAPS B11 had the ensemble mean uh, definitely outside of the envelope. So V12 has increased uh, the usefulness of the spread. Uh, also near the topographic uh, uh, features, uh, the improved representation uh, from V12 is noticed uh, very readily here. The SU team has found the complex features uh, associated with the terrain are better captured in the V12 uh, compared to the V11. Uh, this is one example from uh, a heavy precipitation event in the West Coast uh, that, that was uh, well captured by GAPS V12. The track spreads uh, have improved uh, rather sub substantially here. Uh, this is uh, again an animation. Uh, the current operational system is under dispersive as uh, the the tracks come close. The, the storm comes closer to the coast. The the forecasts were converging into a, a single solution, whereas the gaps B12 maintains the diversity of solutions and provides more meaningful spread uh, in in the uh, in the top of cyclone track forecasts. Uh, there is also improved synaptic predictability and the cyclone deepening, especially for the extratropical cyclones. Uh, one of the coastal storm uh, at the East Coast Atlantic. There is a more lead time in V12 uh, for the storm trough uh, uh, impacting the northern Alaska. And the features uh, from the GAPS V12 were more usable uh, compared to the V11 for these cases. So to summarize the metrics, the GAPS V12 uh, atmospheric matrix, uh, as looked at uh, by individual parameters, these are based on both subjective and objective evaluation. Uh, the winds, uh, heights, these are all northern hemispheric uh, variables. The 10 meter winds, 2 meter temperature, precipitation. The scale has improved uni uniformly. The spread has increased. Uh, the tropical cyclone tracks, except for the Eastern Pacific, uh, have improved. In terms of biases, there are some mixed uh, responses here. Uh, the winds have improved where, uh, in the 250 hectopascal, whereas the 500 millibar, the biases were uh, showing a, a degradation. Uh, also for the precip, for the higher amounts, there is a, a negative uh, improvement here. Uh, the along track and cross track errors also have improved, uh, are increased uh, uh, from V12 compared to the V11. Uh, similarly, for the southern hemisphere, the skill has improved. The spread largely improved. There are, uh, similar to the northern hemisphere, there are some uh, areas where the biases have uh, changed its, uh, their signal, sometimes uh, in a negative way. Uh, in, in terms of uh, the tropics, the 850 tropics has improved, whereas the upper level winds, uh, the biases have degraded. Uh, in terms of waves, again, universal improvement in terms of significant wave heights, the peak wave period, either neutral or improved, uh, both for the wind seas and the swell. Uh, for aerosol, uh, there are significant improvements in the African dust, South American biomass burning, and overall North American uh, biases have improved. Uh, in other areas, they are uh, either neutral, uh, mostly neutral. There is some strong over prediction uh, for the Asian sulfate, probably related to the COVID situation where the pollution is much less uh, during this period. And the ocean sea salt uh, also has some issues, probably related to wet scavenging, uh, likely too low in our tracer transports. The SU team uh, also did a, a subjective rating of the GAPS V11 compared to the V12. And the rating goes from minus three to three. And the number of cases rated as good or better than V11 uh, are, are aggregated here, and worse are aggregated here, starting from day one all the way to day 10. And you can see throughout the period of forecasts, the usefulness of uh, the GAPS V12 is much higher, almost into 70s, 80s, and 90s, compared to 10s and 20s uh, uh, with respect to the V11. So there is some uh, clear utility even in the short range uh, that, that we can see uh, compared to the V11. Uh, moving on to looking at some common concerns, there are some progressiveness of uh, upper level trough, low QPF bias, handling of Arctic mass, uh, reduced instability. These are um, probably inherited from the 15 configuration that we 
uh, discussed earlier uh, when the GFS B15 was evaluated. In addition, we also see the right of track bias uh, spread sometimes occasionally being a large and issues with the West Coast performance and some overmixing in the PBL along with moisture gradients. So the progressiveness of uh, the troughs and ridges, they are uh, especially related to the cutoff flows. This is a known bias of the FE3-based global model and uh, the ensemble also uh, reflected similar progressiveness uh, uh, with respect to these uh, uh, synoptic systems. The QPF bias uh, uh, is, is uh, found to be low at uh, higher thresholds. The V11 nicely captured the higher uh, precipitation amounts. The V12 was not capturing it. Uh, we have to consider the probabilistic QPF. There may be some members who are uh, uh, going to be more useful than other members. Uh, but it's an issue that, that requires access to all ensemble members by the field, which is something we should be arguing for. The Arctic air mass intrusions, uh, again, borrowing uh, similar characteristics from the GFS V15, a clear low level cold bias uh, that was identified. This is also shown in the gaps V12 compared to V11, the V12 is uh, uh, much colder. The instability and the PBL mixing, uh, some of the cases uh, have shown the problems with the PBL. Uh, the dry line can be forecasted too far east, for instance, uh, due to overly aggressive, uh, aggressive PBL mixing. Uh, this is, uh, again, an uh, area of uh, physics improvement that both the GFS models uh, require. The right of the track bias here, uh, this is the V11 uh, compared to the V12 here. There are several members uh, from this ensemble for tropical cyclone Irma, uh, having uh, shown the right of the track bias, especially at the longer lead times, uh, that could be uh, of consideration when NHC or other forecasters use this information, they may want to keep that in mind that occasionally the right of track bias will show up, especially for the uh, recurving storms. So based on all this evaluation, the field has voted uh, and provided their recommendations. And you can see all the regions here, uh, you know, uh, endorsing recommendation, recommending the implementation of uh, GAPS B12. There are key remarks that are summarized here, I'm not going through all of them. The Pacific region also said uh, no concerns, implement. All the centers who participated in this uh, field evaluation, WPC, SPC, NHC, uh, endorsed implementation along with CPC, uh, who has also done a great uh, uh, support in terms of evaluating the weeks two and weeks three and four. Uh, the wave, wave field evaluation done by OPC, Alaska region, Canadians, uh, National Hurricane Center, they also anonymously endorsed implementation uh, along with the Western region, ARL, Southern region, and Alaska region for aerosol evaluation. So uh, this is uh, uh, almost the close of my talk here. Uh, the benefits are uh, substantially improved uh, skill compared to the GAPS V11 or the global wave ensembles or the NGAC V2. Uh, I'm not going to read all of them, but these are definitely much desirable outcomes uh, that the field is waiting for. There are some issues or concerns for the future improvement, especially the temperature bias near the surface. Uh, this is a uh, Something that might be able to uh, alleviate if we use the reforecast data that can be used to reduce the biases. Uh, the progressiveness of the large scale systems, the intensity of uh, heavy precip, the cross track bias, reduced instability, some extreme weather related aspects of it, uh, MJO amplitude being weaker in the weeks three and four, uh, the GAPS B12 aerosol, especially for spring biomass burning in Africa. Those are areas of concern that will be subjected for uh, future implementations. Improvement, improvements will be targeting on them. There will be new products coming from GAPS V12, higher resolution, uh, more levels, uh, and uh, 2082 stations will now provide all 31 member buffer data so that the plumes uh, can be made available for individual stations. And then the daily mean products uh, from various uh, uh, fields along with the wave ensembles and the aerosol uh, data at higher resolution. The GAPS B12 is a complex system. It will be using more resources in operations than the current operational system, both because of the new model, higher resolution, increased uh, membership, and uh, our engineering branch along with the GAPS uh, project team has uh, successfully designed this uh, project 
uh, this, this product in such a way that it fits into one of our operational supercomputer. Uh, the complexity of the system has increased a threefold because of the inclusion of the waves and aerosols with the atmosphere. But again, another techn technical marvel achieved uh, by our uh, system engineers and the scientists at uh, uh, various organizations. Several public notifications were issued uh, to, uh, uh, to describe the impact of uh, these changes for the V12. Uh, so far, no feedback was received. So we will be going uh, with an implementation as uh, proposed. So the timeline actually started much before uh, the reanalysis and reforecast project was uh, frozen. Uh, we have given the science briefing to the director last uh, couple of weeks ago, and uh, we are providing the final package to NCO actually tomorrow, 22nd, with a plan to implement this model on September 9th. So the future plans continue developing the fully coupled system uh, with a couple DA, couple reanalysis reforecast project. The UFS R2O project is uh, uh, providing the basis for developing the next generation GFS V17 and GEFS V13. Uh, both the medium range and sub seasonal applications will be combined into uh, one system uh, with the next implementation. So we will be focusing on addressing the concerns from both the GFS V15, 16, and the GEFS V12 uh, to make further improvements. So that's uh, all about it. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Vijay. Uh, we have two more minutes left till the end of the meeting. If I'm going to unmute everyone uh, in case anyone has questions. Go ahead. I've unmuted everyone. Uh, this is Cliff Mass. I have a question. Is that okay? Yes, Cliff. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, really nice talk and impressive results. One major question is, you're running it every six hours. Do you consider running it every 12 hours and therefore be able to increase your resolution and number of members? Could you end up with better long-term skill if you'd done it twice a day instead of four times a day in terms of our, the ensemble system? Uh, that is not to the scope of this current effort, but uh, you know there is a there are certain limitations on disseminating the data. It's not necessarily just the compute, and uh, the, the the system has certain limitations that we cannot go with more than certain node utilization on any partition of the WCOS. So there are other uh, scalability tests that we we did, but this is the best possible configuration that we came out with. And stopping 6Z and 18Z doesn't really add at 12Z uh, and 0Z because of the high watermark. Right. So you, you so you couldn't take advantage of not having the 06 and 18 enhancing the 0, 012 because that's what European Center does. They do it twice a day. And you know maybe so we couldn't be closer to them in terms of number of members and resolution because of of W costs limitations. Is is that what you're saying? Yeah, we. I mean, we use different members at different time periods too. So the total utility of it is like increased membership. That that's that's what uh, is reflected here. Okay, thanks. Um, we're at the top of the hour now. Uh, if there are no more questions, uh, we can close the meeting. More questions? Okay, thank you all for attending. Thank you, Vijay. Uh, this meeting is has been recorded and will be made available to everyone through the UFS portal. Thank you. Now have a good Memorial Day weekend. Thank you. Thank you.